Um, brilliant. Well, yeah, thank you for the uh, invitation. Really uh, excited to be here. Um, so, yeah, the title, as you can see here, Computational Engineering, Resolving Catastrophic Complexity Through Mass Collaboration. Uh, reading that in the cold light of day, that does sound <laughs> a little bit complicated. Um, so, uh, actually, a slightly simpler title, How to Change the World which admittedly is still quite a grandiose title, so we'll see how we get on on a, on a Thursday afternoon. Um, so maybe just to introduce myself, um, my name's Al Fisher, I'm a director of Bureau Hapold, uh, based in the London office here. Um, I've been working for Bureau Hapold uh, 13, 14 years now. Uh, my background is uh, structural uh, engineering. Um, uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the sort of projects, the background that I've been sort of working on. Uh, but more recently, my role now in, in Bureau Hapold is uh, Head of Computational Development. So we'll be talking a little bit about what we call computational engineering and a little about the sort of strategies and the processes that we're, we're um, uh, pushing from, from within Bureau Hapold. Um, so yeah, a bit about the sorts of projects that I've kind of been uh, sort of involved in over, over, over the years. And it's, there's been a sort of a common thread of some level of uh, complexity, either in the sort of geometry of the, of the form of the projects, uh, or some sort of complexity in the um, structural analysis or the design or analysis processes that have been required to, to realize the projects. Um, so this is just a snapshot of some of them over the last few years. So uh, back from sort of 2007, uh, on the left-hand side there, that's uh, Scunthorpe uh, uh, Sports Academy, uh, Andrew Wright Architects. Uh, so it's a, a glue lamb, uh, geodesic dome, uh, sort of sports uh, academy up in the, in the north of England there. Um, in, the, in the sort of middle left there, that's the uh, Louvre Abu Dhabi, uh, it's a 180 meter diameter dome, uh, st uh, structural space frame with multiple layers of cladding, so complex optimization of the, of the structure and the form of those. And then more recently, I've been involved in some sort of stadia work, where again, there's a sort of necessity for in creating a sort of a large in enclosure of, of, of space, of again, large spans, lightweight approaches to defining the structure to create the form, um, and, and, and by necessity, some sort of complexity in the, in the geometry as well. Um, so I'm going to touch a little bit on, on, on some of those projects as well, but again in the sort of theme of computational development. Um, I, th I suppose you know, many of you may be a bit familiar with sort of the sort of projects that are in the sort of uh, the heart of Bureau Hapol. We're a multidisciplinary firm uh, across sort of 23 odd uh, offices, a global firm, um, 1,800 sort of 2,000 odd employees, multidisciplinary across all the disciplines of the the, uh, the built environment, from structural engineering to acoustics to you know city-sized uh, sort of master planning and and. Uh, you know, economics. Um, there is sort of in the DNA of, of Bureau Hapold, I suppose I could say, um, uh, an element of it originating out of structural engineering. Um, Ted Hapold, the founding partner, you know, um, sort of uh, originated, founded uh, Bureau Hapold in, in Bath, uh, coming from uh, Arup with some of the colleagues there. And these are some of the early, uh, so a lot of the early projects were really looking at uh, playing with um, innovative forms to realize complex uh, uh, structures. Um, so there's sort of British Museum roof just around the corner from us here, um, and sort of, the, you know, in, in sort of grid shell type structures. And then a lot of the early work was really playing with forms with sort of tensile, tensile fabrics to sort of create en enclosures um, in, that, in that way as well. Um, I want to, I'll be sort of coming back to this theme of, of balance in a way, because I think as we sort of, as a profession, uh, uh, there's, you know, a number of different, uh, you know, uh, forces, uh, uh, design constraints that we're naturally trying to sort of balance at all times in terms of trying to either design or optimize or push backwards and forwards against finding a, a, an optimum uh, design solution, working with all the, all the necessary, to, necessary sort of moving parts in a, in a, in a complex design team. Um, so I'll be returning to this sort of uh, concept of trading off and balancing between, uh, between whether that's, that's um, uh, design constraints or skill sets that we, we need as a profession. Um, and starting a little bit about what sort of drives design. Um, so, I mean, I like to talk about geometry. It's one of my favorite subjects. Uh, and obviously, you know, there's a great sort of, you know, uh, heritage in, in looking at natural forms and natural shapes and geometry in terms of generating incredibly efficient uh, structural um, uh, formations. 
So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen many of these sort of images before, but sort of soap film bubbles creating sort of minimal surfaces within an equilibrium pressure. Uh, you know, Gaudi's sort of very, very famous on the, on the bottom left-hand side there, uh, hanging chain models for the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. So obviously using the sort of inverted catenary to make sort of efficient compression, compression structures. Um, even though, you know, I'm standing here, you know, talking about computational uh, design, uh, there's this sort of thread of the model, whether that's a sort of computer model now or historically would have been the sort of physical model. This is, you know, <clears throat> before my time, uh, but this is, you know, early days of Pierre Hapold, uh, you know, there and, and, and across our, our whole industry, there was really no other way to sort of generate some of these complex forms other than with a, a physical model, you know. Uh, frankly, computers did not even really exist, uh, so the uh, physical model had to be a sort of an analogue computer to sort of create the, the formation. And what I like about this photo, which is, you know, showing some very early photos of uh, uh, some of the early, early partners and collaborators in, in, in Bureau Hapod, is it's inherently sort of collaborative. There are people crowding around something which they can actually see and they can poke and they can prod and they can ask ask questions about. It's incredibly sort of tactile. You can sort of say, is that right? Can I sort of poke and like, can I sort of, can I sort of prod it? Um, and so, I mean, this is actually a, a model from the, the Scunthorpe uh, Sports Academy project in 2007. So this was a, a project that I was working on closely with uh, architect Andrew, Andrew, Andrew Wright. Um, and again, this was a very early model. I like showing this one because it was where we were sort of j jarring against. There was a physicality. There was something that he wanted to create. There was a form that he was feeling frustrated that he wanted to play with the different gridding patterns across this complex form. Um, and yet the physical model was pushing at the boundaries of what he could actually achieve. So there was this sort of tension between what we could achieve and how we could communicate. And so this was uh, some of the very uh, first sort of dabbling of using scripts straight out of, my, you know, joining Bureau Hapold in, in 2007. So on the left-hand side there, some, you know, awful don't look too close, uh, you know, uh, VB script uh, that's, you know, doing some early sort of dynamic relaxation um, inspired by the, the, the work of the British Museum roof. Now you get that for free. I mean, the latest version of uh, Rhino 6 got Grasshopper built in, which has got Kangaroo built in. You get that for free with a couple of nodes. So I think it's quite interesting now that the technologies that we have that our finger tips to be able to play with these forms uh, are evolving at an increasing rate. So before it would have taken, you know, hours, days, weeks to be able to create a physical prototype to explore a form. Uh, now you can literally sort of create it in, in literally mere, mere seconds. Um, so what does that mean to, for us, for our sort of profession? Um, so here there are, you know, there's increasing these skill sets that we're required to be able to be um, conversant in. Um, so here on the left-hand side there, that's a snapshot of, uh, you know, uh, Revit, uh, so, so BIM platforms, object oriented modeling through to then in the middle two ones, that's uh, various examples of flow-based programming. So Dynamo, which sits on top of Revit and Grasshopper, which sits on top of Rhino, through to then maybe some uh, uh, basic level of scripting, text-based scripting, maybe that's uh, uh, Python or Visual, Visual Basic, through to what I might call on the right-hand side, hardcore computer programming, so, you know, C-sharp and, and C++. So there's a sort of uh, continuum of, of, of computational digital skills that we, um, we need to be able to be sort of um, conversant in uh, to be able to sort of collaborate and work together in, in, our, in our industry. And so... We, we, you know, talking about the term sort of computational engineering, that this kind of is increasingly a, a challenge that we're facing, really. They, you know, like to talk about co-creation, you know, we, it's an inherently a collaborative um, industry that we're in. I mean, the, the comments earlier just now saying, you know, we're all part of a team. You know, it's very difficult to sort of say, you know, me or I did this. You know, we're all doing it as part of a, of a network of, of collaborative, collaborating individuals. But actually, we send, spend so much time behind the sort of computer screen, whether that's doing modeling or even just, you know, uh, you know doing emails or whatever, uh, it's an inherently an isolating environment. So sort I of say, I'm stuck, I'm sat behind this screen. How do I, I can't even touch this sort of uh, virtual, virtual model. So this is something we're acutely um, interested in, in saying, how can we tackle this challenge of we need to be able to exploit and leverage all of these technologies that are available to us, but how do we do that in a way that actually facilitates and maybe even encourages or accelerates the ability to collaborate and co-create and work, work together as a team? 
So before I do a bit more about you know, technology, I want to sort of maybe to make this sort of, you know, standing inside the Institute of Structural Engineers, let's talk a little bit about um, you know, what, what's the purpose of all this? What might we be using it for? So here's some concrete examples. So to come back to this idea of you know, what's actually driving form? What are we actually, what are these processes even for? Why might I even, what's the purpose of writing a, a computer program? What's the purpose of writing a, a, writing a script? And so using a couple of examples, sort of going back to, uh, you know, as a, as a structural engineer, uh, well, how, what are the constraints? What are actually going to be those driving forces to create the, the, um, the final form of, of, our, of, our, of our structures? Um, these are two, you know, you know sort of conflicting, sort of uh, contrasting examples. On the left-hand side, that's uh, you may recognise that that's a Wilden Downland Museum grid shell um, from the um, uh, from, uh, uh, Edward uh, Cullen Architects and uh, Bureau Happold. And then on the right-hand side, there, that's a cable net, uh, cable net structure for the Olympic Stadium. Both of those are actually defining a natural equilibrium geometry based on some. Uh, initial boundary conditions, some materiality, some internal forces, some external forces. And it's the combination of all of those that actually give you, a, obviously, a very uh, different uh, end result. Um, these are some uh, fantastic sort of uh, uh, photos I love sort of flicking through because it kind of shows exactly this sort of, rather than this being a computational form-finding process where you've set up some sort of boundary conditions and let this computer program work, this is actually working in reality. So this is a, the Wilder Downland Museum with continuous timber, timber laths. So these are actually running straight through and then lapped over each other to create a, a flat uh, quad, quadratic uh, mesh um, and you can see it's actually uh, been laid out at, uh, at a level of ele elevation on top of the scaffolding so that actually as you take the scaffolding away, this is a sort of a time lapse, you can see that actually gravity is assisting in allowing the uh, timber to sort of drape into its final position. And what's interesting here, you can see because of the nature of starting with a, a flat uh, mesh, and then allowing it to sort of drape downwards, you can see the final form of this sort of undulating hourglass shape is naturally sort of emerging out of the uh, conditions of the initial initial geometry in uh, and the obviously the materiality, the flexibility of the of the timber lars, and then the, and the final boundary conditions, and so you end up with this. Um, organic, uh, natural-looking form, which is, you know, as I say, this sort of triple, triple hourglass, um, which then can be sort of fixed into place, actually sort of extra diagonal bracing, and can be put in there to sort of stiffen it up to be able to take some other sort of, uh, you know, as asymmetric load cases and sort of level of robustness as well. Um, but actually, therefore, that final form is actually really playing with what those are uh, being expressed from the actual materiality and the, and the construction process. Similarly, another sort of a quick example, of, you know, a famous example of this is the cable net for the uh, Olympic Stadium. Uh, again, balancing the internal forces here. So again, really sort of uh, uh, irrespective of the sort of gravity load here, the primary forces here are the sort of internal pre-stresses, which are saying this is the uh, uh, equilibrium geometry for taking the sort of cables laid out on the floor. So this is the uh, construction sequence here. Circular tension ring, so continuous cables running around, and then radial cables out to the compression ring, much like a sort of bicycle wheel with a sort of a, a tension ring working as a sort of a uh, el in enlarged uh, central hub. Uh, tightening those cables up basically pulls the uh, tension ring into its final uh, final equilibrium position. So that's, again, a very sort of pure uh, balancing where the for geometry is expressed directly by the, by the forces in the, um, uh, the internal forces of the pre-stresses of the cables. Um, so this was, you know, obviously 2012. You can sort of see the stadium there. Um, this was an interesting project. So this is obviously Populous uh, Architects. Uh, so obviously as part of the legacy of uh, the Olympic Park, really looking at then how to actually uh, reutilize the stadium uh, for greater flexibility of, of pitch sports, uh, therefore wanting greater coverage of the, of the seats. So therefore playing with this saying, how do we actually therefore create a, uh, an additional 
doubling of the area of the roof, but actually then saying, well, on the same, on the same sort of boundary conditions. So here, that's a contrast of now the London Stadium, now obviously um, home to, to West Ham, uh, on the left-hand side, the original, uh, original stadium. That's the same uh, with some strengthening of the connections, but that's the same uh, boundary conditions. It's the same foundations. It's the same columns uh, supporting this roof. So how do you do that sleight of hand of actually doubling the entirety of the uh, roof area on the same boundary conditions? So this is again saying, well, okay, on the left-hand side, this is working very much like uh, the primary f f uh, forces working on this are internal pre-stresses tensioning, tensioning the cable net. So on the analogy, I like to sort of, sort of think of this as almost like if you take a, a washing line, there are two ways of being able to put extra tension into that washing line. You can either tighten the, the, the cable, the, the washing line, to tension it up, or you can dump a whole load of washing on top. And so you actually end up with exactly the same end result with the same tension in the, in the cables. Um, so on the right-hand side, what was done here was actually rather than it being uh, what you would call a pre-stressed cable net, which was the original Olympic Stadium, the transformation stadium with double the roof, with the gravity, the weight of the roof was the primary mechanism for um, pre-stressing the, uh, pre the cable net. So you can kind of see this is the, the geometry for the uh, revised cable net. See, it's similar sort of radial cables and um, uh, central circumferential uh, tension ring. The actual, rather than uh, stressing the cable net by pulling and uh, uh, post-tensioning the or tensioning the cables into place, uh, the uh, pre-stressing mechanism is actually done, created by the weight of the roof. Well, how do you do that when the roof obviously got, you can't construct the cable net with? without the roof there, because the cable net is reliant to support the roof. And so this is where, again, the, 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 uh, the construction mechanism for creating these sort of gravity st uh, stretch cable nets is effectively tying down, forcing the geometry and saying, actually, this is the final geometry I know you are going to want to be in. Once I have loaded you up with the final roof and released those tie downs, you'll end up in the final, uh, the final equilibrium position. So there's a kind of playing here and kind of saying, no, no, the geometry is not going to emerge gradually over time. I'm going to force you into position. And then once we release... The, or you will, you, or you will, I will know you will be in the right position because you'll be in, in equilibrium. So again, this sort of playing with this idea of what are the external pressures on driving and, and defining these uh, these structures. So I mean, there's a couple of examples there which um, you know demonstrate in a very sort of real sort of you know uh, structural approaches to sort of defining the form based on either the materiality of the of the of the of the structure itself. Uh, its own geometry, the internal forces either uh, induced by gravity or induced by um, pre-stressing. And I suppose what we're starting to look at now as we look at increasingly uh, you know, um, more ambitious and in trying to be uh, ever more, um, achieve more with our, with our architecture is, well, how far can we push this? What are some other parameters which we need to be incorporating into these form-finding processes? Um, this is a sort of fun video that I, I, I like showing, which is the, you know, starting to say, well, okay, we've got a, uh, we've got a roof. This is another cable net roof. This is for a um, project um, out in Qatar. So this is saying, well, okay, we've got the, the geometry of the roof, but what are some other constraints that we need to be satisfying here? Okay, it might be an equilibrium. Okay, it might actually have the right tonnage, but how can we actually start to sort of interact with these models in a way to satisfy some greater criteria? So here we're actually using virtual reality and we're saying, well, actually, we've got this model. It's live linked to the form finding process to ensure all the cables are the right size. The geometry is correct, but I'm standing there with... Uh, uh, you know, virtual reality goggles, you can see my point of view on the screen there. My glamorous assistant here, Arno, is then controlling the model. So I'm sitting there, I'm going, right, put me to the back of bowl. See the view that I can see from the back of bowl. And this purple plane that you can kind of see here is representing the field of, the field of view from the back of the bowl. And there's a, a constraint which is important in uh, bowl design, which is the high ball line, which is if someone sort of boots the ball up into the, the maximum height, that it's not obscured by any structure. So I'm able to sort of experience what it's like to be in the bowl and say, actually, can we do a trade-off here? Can we actually tighten those cables up and pull that... Uh, that structure up higher to actually um, 
give me greater view constraints, but then actually there's a trade-off here. There's a balance between quality of view and then maybe the flatter that cable net is. Obviously, the larger the forces are going to be uh, billion in that model. And I think I'm now just sort of flying around having a look, I think. So, <laughs> um, so I suppose as we build these sort of models, there are obviously any constraints that we can put into there. Either that's something very um, physical in terms of representing the actual sort of physical... Uh, physical world in terms of a physical form finding process. Maybe it's something more um, actually subjective. Uh, maybe it's something to do with actually the sort of um, uh, properties which uh, are not inherently structural in themselves. Um, so, you know, looking at other properties such as environmental constraints or lighting constraints to say how can we actually use those forces to then drive the, uh, the form of the structure. Um, this is a photograph of the um, Louvre Abu Dhabi, uh, now open uh, in uh, uh, Sadiat Islands and, and coast of Abu Dhabi. This um, working with um, the architects here is uh, um, uh, Jean Nivelle Associates. So it's a 180 meter diameter uh, space frame, so st uh, steel space frame, um, covered in uh, eight layers of cladding, four on the inside, four on the outside, to therefore control the microclimate in the, in the spaces below. So on the right-hand side, there's a very clear structural problem here. This thing's got to sort of stand up. It's got to sit there, something of this scale. There's a very real gravity driving force, which is actually self weight is driving the uh, optimization processes. So you can see on the right-hand side, you can see the clustering of sizing the elements around the supports, and then uh, as it arches out across the supports, um, optimizing the elements to be able to span across there. On the left-hand side, though, this cladding itself is a, you know, inherently the spans it's covering is a structure in itself. There are additional constraints there to say, again, there's the default, hey, as a structure, there's a default compliance, you need to be able to stand up, you need to be resistive forces, but actually can we start to sort of penetrate, can we push and poke and, and uh, drive some of the, the shapes of these based on environmental constraints? So the patterns that you can see uh, on the left-hand side are actually driven by the lighting constraints and the microclimate constraints in the gallery spaces below as so I'll be able to paint a map and say, well, actually, where we want to be actually encouraging greater lights to come in in, in order to sort of create light in the museum spaces below, let's create, uh, create greater perforations where we want to sort of close those holes up to control the microclimate and, and isolate from the external um, uh, radiant light. Let's close those holes up. And so, again, an additional sort of balance that you need to be able to sort of uh, control both of those so they're sort of mutually, mutually compatible. And so it's starting to be these sort of subjective um, properties and subjective drivers that um, increasingly combining them with the sort of uh, the physical and more uh, environmental uh, base properties that starts to become quite interesting to how do, we, how do we create these complex models to do those both simultaneously. And when you start talking about subjective properties, then it's kind of like starts to be the sort of uh, experiential. This is actually a photo of uh, taken from earlier this year. So I would actually, if anybody has the chance to go and experience what it's like to be in the, the Louvre, I mean, it's one of the great global museums, I would have to say. It's kind of incredible to be in that, that space. So how do you design for something that is inherently experiential? You know, how do you, how do you predict that? How do you know in advance? And actually... My experience is not the same as your experience. And so this is, again, some of the work that started to play around with. This is a, a prototype, again, using virtual reality for looking at um, in our inclusivity team, looking at actually how is, what is it like to play in these spaces, be in these spaces um, with uh, differing um, uh, disabilities. So this is actually starting to look at, uh, during the design process, being able to inhabit the space with um, different um, uh, sight um, issues with sight and visibility, so playing with you know uh, glaucoma and uh, color blindness. Um, later on in the video as well, see if I can sort of speed it up. There's uh, playing around with uh, being in uh, non-able-bodied people in wheelchairs, being able to say, how do I actually m navigate around this space? In actually, what's it like to traverse this space? Actually, going up a slope. You know, actually, what is it like as a designer? Can I experience what it's going to be like for the end user as part of the design process? 
it's actually, there's a warning on the beginning of that video, actually, that says if you suffer from uh, sickness in VR, then you shouldn't use it. And I, it's actually, <laughs> I tend to be one of those people, actually. It's incredibly, uh, <laughs> it's, incredibly it's really an interesting, alienating experience to sort of be part of the model as you're, you know, experiencing it in, in, in a different way outside of your normal um, uh, range of experiences. So again, we're kind of saying, well, again, it's all about balance. You know, how do, when you start to overlay all of these, you know, multiple different constraints, where, where, do, we, where do we end up as, as well, selfishly, as, as I suppose, structural engineers? Um, a few examples now are sort of very sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know the, what could be achieved now with computational tools in, in uh, Grasshopper, you know, at the very, you know, uh, sort of simple level, a sort of a truss, uh, model or at the scale of entire buildings, so being able to uh, generate, you know, 145 BIM models for tall buildings in, you know, 120 stories in two seconds, you know, why would you want to, well, actually, this script was generated for doing some uh, performance testing of, of some of our code, but it's now this, it's this easy now to sort of generate some of these, some of these models. Um, indeed, actually sort of playing around with saying, well, let's actually put the computer back in its box to say, well, actually, how do I want to interact with these? Can I start to, you know, interact with them from a, from a sketching environment? So sketch, sketching over, over the architect's plans and then the uh, analysis model actually just sort of, uh, you know, generating itself. So we're spending more of our time with our human brain engaged in the design process rather than necessarily fiddling around with um, analytical models. So, okay, so we can do this, but then I suppose the order of magnitude, the complexity of this continues to rise and rise. So, you know, across any sort of building scale typologies, you can do this. So high rise, inherently parametric, you can sort of generate uh, high rise buildings very, you know, very, very easily in a sort of computational way through to, you know, bridges, you know, airports, you know, stadia, a lot of the work in stadia, you know, very sort of compliance rule based, you can sort of generate options very, very easily going up to the sort of habitat scale. This is not limited now to just individual buildings, but playing with uh, GIS, so global um, geographical information uh, systems, being able to then extract those and being able to do trade-offs again, saying, well, actually across all of these different parameters of demographics and uh, um, uh, region usages, you can start to do sort of trade-offs. And again, you can see here, actually at the level of being able to do, you know, stakeholder engagement to say, well, actually, if there are all these possible solution spaces of possible options, how do you engage and make a, uh, make a decision? So I think this is, in a way, the sort of challenge that we're sort of, sort of faced in, um, in our sort of profession, in a way, that there is this sort of spectrum of, of, of tools and skills that maybe we are sort of expected to be able to um, engage with. How do we sort of uh, make that fit for purpose? How do we sort of still make sure that we're, we're able to use those for, uh, I suppose, uh, in, you know, creating the good design? Um, and so it's very key, you know, it's very important to continue to remember that actually these are all just tools. You know, this is just a tool that should be in service of this sort of stuff. So, you know, as we go around, you know, we talk to our... Um, uh, you know, graduate engineers and junior engineers in our, in our practice, it's really important to remind, say, no, no, we still need to be doing this. This is incredibly important. Some of the most, you know, valuable conversations that can be had with our collaborators, with our other engineers and with our, you know, architect friends and, and, and clients are actually expressing and storytelling uh, without a computer uh, and actually with a, you know, pen and paper in our hand and being able to express our ideas and sketch. So it's incredibly important that we don't actually lose sight of this as a, as a core skill. Um, but I'm sorry to say, you need to do both. <laughs> um, uh, and it's you know, not like Homer Simpson that one thing goes in and, and something else falls out the other side. We need to be able to sort of upskill. So you know, if you learn to ride a bike, you can still you know, walk. You, know, you, can do, you can do both simul simultaneously. Um, so we talk a lot about mass participation in computational engineering. Um, and it's important for, I think, for our profession for many reasons, but not least of all, that we all need to be able to participate. They you know, like to talk a lot and we, you know, t about this sort of dread dreaded black box. You know, um, you know, if we're, if we're part participating in a design, you know, we do need to be able to say, is that doing what I want it to do? Do I know what's going on under that hood? Did I, if I said I put you know, input 
A went in and, and output C has come out the other side. How, how, are we, uh, how can we be sure that we're happy that what's going on is going on? So having the capacity and the ability to sort of open, open up the black box and see what's under the hood is a really important uh, a, 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 a philosophy, especially in, I think, a sort of technical profession such as, you know, such as you know, our, our sort of engineering discipline. And going further than that, you know, we're talking about mass participation in code development, which then starts to sound a bit, well, crumbs, that's a bit scary. Um, but we're not really the first people to say this. These are sort of famous quotes. Uh, so everybody in this country should learn to program a computer because it teaches you how to think. Uh, Steve Jobs there, famously um, advocating computers. I mean, he's not bi uh, unbiased, I suppose. Um, whether you want to uncover the secrets of the universe or you just want to pursue a career in the 21st century, basic computer programming is an essential skill to learn. So, again, it's really important now that there is, in order to be able to sort of participate and be able to get under the hood of some of these um, technical processes, having that basic essential skills in programming is really, really important. Um, so, if you're happy, we're kind of madly serious about mass participation to the extent that uh, you, myself and a couple of my colleagues have spent the last two years on too many airplanes flying around all of our global offices. Uh, so, you can see here some images of what we've been doing as a general upskilling of, of the staff to say, actually, it's incredibly important that on a human-to-human -human level, we work out how we can actually create the community, create the uh, skill sets diversely across the practice to be able to all participate in what we're calling computational engineering. Um, so again, it's a lot of fun, uh, quite tiring, but going around all the different offices, uh, running, all of these, running all of these sessions. Um, and again, talking about balance, it's um, hugely valuable and I would say essential that any processes or any uh, tools that we develop are actually developed with the fingerprints of more than one or two or three or a handful of individuals. Um, so, because actually the, the structural engineer in, 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 in uh, San Francisco might actually need, you know, have completely different concerns or worries than the structural engineer in, in, uh, in Hong Kong or, uh, or Mumbai. Um, take that even further and say the acoustician in, you know, Bath, you know, what, what are their needs compared to, say, the lighting engineer in, in Dubai? So having that mix of uh, diversity of regionality, specificity, uh, uh, discipline, uh, experience, and uh, authenticity, and also grade of seniority and junior individuals mixing to be able to help shape uh, the, the working processes is incredibly important. This is a, a window onto our uh, central code repositories, um, which is showing now how we've been really do a lot of learning, really, to say how do we architect uh, a set of computational tools that are fit for purpose for uh, you know, a d diverse set of uh, collaborators, um, creators, and, and users. So on the left-hand side, you can see in blue are uh, all the individual um, modules or toolkits or packets of code that are all in the central repositories. On the right-hand side uh, are in sort of yellowy-green are all the individual uh, people, uh, human beings, <laughs> spread around the world in the different, different offices. So you can see it's iterating around from sort of London to Bath to uh, Hong Kong to sort of Los Angeles to, to um, Copenhagen. The red lines are the interesting ones, which are saying which piece of code has been co-authored by which individual. So we've got these fingerprints of uh, 55 different individuals now across the globe that have all helped co-author uh, this central, uh, central code base. And it's this sort of openness and approach to sort of sharing of code that we found incredibly valuable to sort of make sure it's um, uh, fit for purpose um, to the extent where actually we need to make do this in a way that actually everybody can kind of get involved. So we do not need absolutely everybody. You might be reassured to sort of hear I'm not advocating this. Not everybody needs to be able to sort of plug themselves directly into the matrix and become a computer programmer. That's actually exactly what we don't necessarily need. We need to be able to have this spectrum of skill sets and a continuum to say that the people that have those heart, you know, detailed knowledge and capabilities in computer science are able to co-create alongside you know, our brightest and best structural engineers and lighting designers and any other you know, architecture or, or fabricators. 
Uh, so this might actually look quite familiar to you because we kind of were inspired by one of the great uh, global institutes in terms of setting out this in terms of knowledge, experience and ability in, uh, in terms of uh, the core computational competencies. So this is actually going from uh, level one core computational competency in visual programming uh, down to level four to uh, programming advanced. And what's important here, actually, is it's not just kind of saying, oh, there are these sort of dichotomy, this sort of polar, polar opposite, visual programming versus text-based programming. And it's actually really important to say, no, we're doing this in a way that you can transcend and move backwards and forwards between the two. So in basic terms, there's entry-level flow-based visual programming. You, you, you're familiar with making a script on your own. You can make a bit of a spaghetti mess. You know how to do it. That's kind of fine. That's level one. Level two is saying, whoa, 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 okay, that's great, but you can do that in a way that's useful to others. You can co-create. You can co-author scripts that others can maybe pick up and use. Level three is then saying, well, okay, I see the limits of flow-based visual programming. I'm now going to start looking at maybe text-based programming on my own, so maybe make a little script or a little node. Level four is then saying, now I'm now able to do this as part of a, a collaborative, you know, co-author a piece of code along with others as well. So there's this interesting sort of pattern about learning how to do something on your own, learning how to do it with others. And it's that being able to do it with others which is really, really important in order to continue to, to scale. And importantly, level four is set out to say, no, no, your code you're writing in level four must be useful to individuals at levels one and two. Because actually we've got to get beyond this idea that one little bit of code over there that's useful to just one or two individuals, that's not, that's not good enough now in order for us to, to solve some of the, the problems that we want to solve in the world. So we talk a lot about uh, visual or flow-based flow programming, um, inherently because it's actually a really powerful way of breaking down processes. So when we talk about everybody needs to be able to participate in computational engineering, everybody needs to be a programmer, we don't necessarily mean everybody needs to be able to do computer code. We need to think about it in a programmatic way, thinking in terms of this input process output. So thinking in terms of workflows and flow-based programming, how do you combine these things together and what's my input, what process do I have and what comes out the other side. It's an incredibly powerful way of breaking down any complex, uh, complex uh, set of instructions. And importantly, coming back to these levels one, two, three, and four, what we find actually is, you know, most commercially viable computational workflows uh, need a medley of skills, and you could replace commercially viable there with sort of just practical or useful, um, but it really is this mixture of being able to combine maybe some one little node that a, you know, person with a PhD in machine learning has created is then plugged into a network of, of other nodes that, that other people can help use and co-create. So talking a little bit about uh, the BOM, which is the Buildings and Habitats Object Model, that at its core was what, what it has been designed to facilitate. The problem that we were looking to solve was how do you enable people of levels of coding levels one through to four, how do you allow them, how do you facilitate them to be able to generally work together and co-create? And that's really what the, the, build, uh, the BHOM, the BOM, uh, Buildings Habitats Object Model, is, is all about. This is all now open source. So this was open source at the end of last year, so on the 21st of December. Um, this is the core parts of the BOM, all focused on interoperability, is all now completely freely available. Go to uh, bhom.xyz, you can have a look, share it with your friends and family. It's great, great for everyone. Uh, and uh, to have a look, and so it's, um, and it's really looking at tackling this problem of how do we actually co-author these things together. Um, and importantly, one of the things we've been playing with is making this inherently sort of human focus, making this useful to us all as, as designers. So a lot of the work we've been doing is breaking some of the traditional coding uh, paradigms or rules and saying, uh, how can we do it in a way that's fit for purpose for, the, for, for our profession? So we've transformed the way we structure code to more closely align with the way that humans think. So it's actually easier to sort of move through from your early design uh, optioneering through to creating a computational process and continuing to, to evolve it. And importantly, I keep talking about flow-based programming, but a lot of this, what we can talk about in terms of the BOM, it's all code, it's all in, a lot of it's in C sharp, but it's all been designed specifically to work in a flow-based programming environment to facilitate us all designing our workflows, input process, uh, output. 
Um, so maybe just a few more uh, slides as I'll give a bit of uh, detail about, you know, I'm talking about this thing uh, in quite an abstract way. But there's really just sort of three simple parts to it, which again mirror the sort of input process output. So at the basic level, we need to have this sort of common language, this common understanding. When I'm collaborating with you as an architect or, a, or, a, or another a fellow designer, when we share a model, when I say column, or well, we want to know that we're talking the same language, that the co what column means to me means the same to you. So there's a sort of basic object model, thinking in terms of objects rather than data is incredibly useful. On top of that, then they're saying, well, OK, well, once we've got these common objects, what do we do with them? So actually creating some custom tools, creating some engine methods to then manipulate them and actually do something clever with whatever you might want to do, whatever I might want to do on top of those. Importantly, the last bit is saying, well, OK, we know, we're not software engineers. We're structural engineers and uh, uh, you know, engineers working in the AC industry. So this isn't a software development exercise. So we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We should be then saying plugging in and adapting and exploiting each and every really useful piece of software that already exists out there. So the final part is then converting and adapting across to all the existing tools. And so maybe a little simple example to say how that might work would be in terms of input process output is, you know, input might be creating a uh, bomb object, so a door with a height and a width. Um, you then might use an engine method to then plug a hole in that added window or something. And then you might say, well, I'm not existing in isolation here. I want to use some other uh, software to then collaborate with my, my uh, colleagues. Um, so then export it to uh, uh, you know, Revit or analysis package or whatever. And that's a sort of common one, one sort of input process output workflow. This problem of the adapters, though, is something which has obviously sort of been endemic and a, a problem that's been systematically not been solved by the industry, nor is it really in the software industry's interest to make it easy to sort of get in and out of their, of their software. So there's obviously lots of proprietary links between all the pieces of software that we all use, and I don't know how many times we've seen diagrams like this and how frustrated many of us have been like, oh, I've got this you know, piece of data inside here and I want to build this model and get the two to talk to each other. There's an inordinate amount of time as an industry. We are repeatedly wasting time just shuttling data between these platforms. And so that's one very specific um, uh, exercise that the bomb is uh, aiming to sort of make easier is to say just have one central hub common language that all of these tools speak to. And so that's the focus of the code that we've open source was to say, well, actually, this is one uh, possible solution for the industry uh, for others to maybe look at and, and you know, contribute to or, 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 or comment on. Um, so this is just a list of some of the, the toolkits now that are in the uh, in the bomb now. On the right-hand side is the ones that are actually open source right now. And we've taken a very hard line with our approach as a practice to say anything to do with interoperability, anything to do with collaboration and communication, we want to be open sourcing. We want to be sharing with the industry. So there's a few more that we are, you know, our work in progress, which we'll be looking to be uh, sharing, sharing as well. And what's kind of important about interoperability really is it has almost slows down the challenge of passing this data around. It almost puts the brakes on uh, collaboration and co-creation. So I sort of like to sort of juxtapose the, the you know, the, the old photo of us crowding around a physical model that we can prod and poke. But by having these platforms that can sort of seamlessly uh, shuttle the data together allows you to be able to, in a, you know, in a computational digital world, recreate some of that responsiveness of asking a question and prodding, prodding and poking. So on the right-hand side there actually is a video which is a, a little old now, a, a year or a couple of years old, uh, using a platform called Flux, which was allowing you to directly tether together uh, multiple analysis models, multiple um, geometrical models. So you can see here there's a stadium model, you've got a ro uh, robot structural analysis model doing a, a slice of one of the cantilever uh, frames on a cable net, you've got uh, sunlight analysis, you know, tonnage automatically being extracted, sea values, deflections, views and things, and being able to very quickly overlay all of those and be able to prod and poke in those. So what was going on there, there was actually a global Google Hangout which was allowing people across the world, and there's 10 individuals, were all being able to interact with the model and say, I'm interested in this, I'm interested in this, do some live sort of optioneering. Trying to go some way to recreating that sort of tactile interaction. And I think what's quite exciting now, I think, in terms of the way the industry is going, is very 
Uh, there's a lot of conversation about uh, open source and, uh, and seeing the merit of that being a sort of fundamental part of any sort of uh, business model. So uh, this is part of a collaboration actually across companies, which is industry funded. So it's the uh, UK government, uh, AEC, Delta, uh, mobility project that's been um, this in progress at the moment. This is a collaboration across a number of open source projects, the BOM uh, being one of them, uh, Speckleworks, uh, which is MIT licensed, and uh, 3D Repo, uh, which is open source as well. And so this is an uh, example of what's been implemented in the last few, few months based on those three platforms, which is recreating some of what I just showed there with, with Flux, which is what was not open source. And so what you can see here on the left-hand side there is a, a, a bomb model. That's a multi-story building with real, uh, you know, it's not just geometry, it's got actual section sizes and proper BIM, BIM information in there. That is live linked together to both Speckle and to 3D Repo, both uh, you know, web accessible portals to be able to see the, see the models. And so when you change any of the section sizes or the geometry and just click refresh, uh, then you can get the latest version. You live link these models together. They're starting to open up the door to being able to sort of have really you know, um, interesting routes to sort of um, more fluid collaboration across, across models and across obviously um, you know, uh, people collaborating. So that's, that's all open source. That's going on over the, the next few years. If anybody's interested in that as well, do ping me, and, and, and uh, you know, that's uh, an ongoing op open project where we sh we're sharing all of the development that's going along. Uh, the key point all of, about all of this, this is all actually about how do we get people to just be able to work together? Uh, how, do we, how do we facilitate uh, more and more people being able to sort of co-create? Uh, so this is actually a graph that over the last uh, three years, the central code repository, starting in January uh, 2016, where we started going, hey, look, there's all this code happening all around our practice, and similarly around the rest of the industry, let's start putting it all in one place. And so the graph here is showing in green bars, that's basically individual commits, that's individual little packets of code that people are sort of submitting to the central cloud-based cloud uh, repository. Uh, on a week by week basis. So you can see it's sort of evolving uh, over time. I'm trying to use the laser actually, that's good. Uh, you can see it's sort of starting at the, at the beginning of, uh, of January 2016 through to uh, the beginning of the, uh, the year or the end of last year. There's a massive spike there, all to do with open sourcing. That's mainly documentation, just to reassure you all, of putting documentation in uh, to facilitate the open sourcing. Um, a piece of, uh, you know, a period that's really uh, interesting to continue to sort of highlight, we like to sort of talk about, is this period which we call the sound of silence, which is where we basically had a sort of an MVP, uh, BOM 1.0 MVP. We were using it on projects, using it on, on live projects. It was working, uh, working and, and facilitating what we needed. Um, However, one of our code developers uh, decided to delete all the code <laughs> in a good way uh, and said, actually, the framework worked. It was fit for, fit, fit for purpose at that point in time. But in order to facilitate greater participation, we needed to sort of delete it, go back to basics, refine it and refactor it and make it as simple as possible. And that's one of the things we're continually wanting, uh, pushing to do is to be able to create things as, uh, that in a format that is one, as simple as possible to allow it to continue to be scalable and build on, and two, do it in a way that facilitates greater people being able to sort of participate and get involved. Um, so something that a part of the software development process, a part of sort of agile development, is really sort of holding yourself to task and saying, well, well, can we, can we make that simpler? Can we sort of uh, simplify it further? So actually one of the things that we now have, I think it's 50, 54, 55 individual contributors, so individuals' fingerprints on the code uh, globally from, from Australia to, uh, to Mumbai, all uh, getting involved. One of the things that's interesting to us is that as we were ramping up to open sourcing, we were talking to other open source uh, software developers who, who shall remain unnamed, uh, but they, they were saying, I don't get too excited. You can open source something. No one's going to see it. No one's going to look at it. You know, just don't get too excited. We're, like, we're managing our expectations. It, was like, it took five years for this open source project to get in its first uh, first external commit. Um, so what's exciting now, we had you know, collaborations with Speckle within the first three months starting to, uh, starting to uh, 
contribute as well, doing the Speckle adapter. And then beyond that as well, we now have uh, five additional toolkits that are being built by uh, individuals outside of Bureau Happold. So really started to see some quite exciting um, activity across, across the uh, industry. So we are really interested, this is not a pitch particularly, but you know, if you are interested to, to get involved, contribute, really, really interesting. And actually, we've seen that actually lots of tiny, small contributions are of much greater value than you know, one, big, uh, one big heap of, uh, heap of Lego. Um, so yeah, if you are interested, do take a look. A final few slides, and I'll start by saying, you know, well, hang on, <laughs> uh, what's this guy talking about? He's supposed to be coming here talking about, you know, uh, structural engineering. He's been talking about software for the last uh, however long. Um, so what, what's the point? Why, why, why are we all doing this? And one thing it's worth kind of remembering, and there's a favourite quote of mine. I don't know if anybody's ever watched uh, Halt and Catch Fire. It's a fantastic uh, well, uh, TV programme from, from the US. Uh, it's based on the early days of, uh, of uh, the personal computer and then uh, Silicon Valley and the startup of the, of the internet as well. Um, and there's a really fantastic quote here which I just want to, to show you. There. Computers aren't the thing. They're the thing that gets us to the thing. And it's, you have to, we have to sort of remember that. We can get lost in this, this spaghetti mess of code and ideas of writing computer tools and things. And you're like, they're, just, they're, just the thi they're not the thing. They're the thing that gets us to the thing. So, okay, you kind of, well, 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 what, what's the thing then? What's the thing? So, uh, if you'll indulge me for one minute longer, I'm just going to read to you this paragraph. I'll read it out for those at the back of the room. So, if we gradually increase the level of integration of a collective intelligence, it may eventually become a unified intellect, a single large mind as opposed to a mere assemblage of loosely interacting smaller human minds. The inhabitants, and I'm going to say the AEC industry here, could take steps in that direction by improving communications and coordination technologies and by developing better ways for many individuals to work on any hard intellectual problem together. A collective superintelligence could thus, after gaining sufficiently in integration, become a quality superintelligence. Wow. I mean, pfft, I don't know if you're up for that or not, but that, I mean, that sounds pretty good to me. Uh, that's a quote, actually, from Nick Bostrom, uh, book Superintelligence, Paths, Dangers and Strategies. I always to ask, has anybody read that? Oh, yes! This is, oh, this is the highest scoring yet. That's two people. That's actually doubled the number of people that read this book, and I've travelled around the world twice. Well done. These guys should get a free drink. Um, <laughs> so anyway, that's a, uh, um, still, you might be saying, great, this guy's gone completely mad. Who put him up on stage? Um, but if you break down that quotation, that paragraph, it's really actually quite simple. It's saying, improving communication and coordination technologies. Well, it's the 21st century. I mean, crumbs, we should be able to do that to de develop better ways for individuals to work on any hard intellectual problem together. Well, that's certainly why I became a structural engineer. I don't know why you're all here, but that's what we should be all aspiring to do. Um, so really, I think that really was my sort of pitch for sort of saying, well, this is our, it's in our hands, actually. And I think in terms of us as a profession, I do really think it's us as engineers that really do have the capacity to change the world. Thank you very much.